So welcome once again for this exciting webinar on long-acting HIV um, treatment. So please note that we are offering or um, there is interpretation in from English to French. As you know, the little globe that's appearing at the bottom of your screen, please um, press onto which interpretation you would prefer, either English or uh, French. A few housekeeping rules. Um, as you know, the webinar will be recorded and shared once it's um, in the next over the next few days. Please mute. Uh, kindly introduce yourself within the um, the chat. Um, I can see people are slowly coming or folks are slowly coming in. And if you have any uh, questions, please make use of the question and answer box as well. And there is a, a Q&A session that will be taking place at the end of uh, the webinar. So following this, um, we have a host of um, individuals that have come far and wide to uh, present us at the uh, during this webinar. So a brief look at the uh, agenda, uh, Nadia Rafif, who's the advocacy and um, advocacy lead, will be um, will be moderating the session, followed by Solange and who will, uh, our executive director at ITPC who will be, will be uh, providing some framing remarks on long acting um, HIV treatment. And uh, Bactrin Kilongo from ITPC will also be providing some basics on HIV infection and treatment. Uh, Tracy Swan, our clinical advisor, will also be providing information on um, long-acting HIV treatment, the long-acting injectables for treating, but for uh, treating HIV infection. Most importantly, uh, Cindy Kalemi from Bonella, who's our um, one of our partners, will be presenting on the community perspective, focusing on challenges, opportunities, and recommendations. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Nadia, who will take you through to the next uh, phase of the session. Thank you, Prabhashani. Welcome, everyone. Bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. So we're here today. Bienvenue à tous. Donc, uh, nous sommes ici pour, uh, bien sûr... ...everywhere and... and uh, we decided that was a good a good time, right, to to discuss among community uh, what does it mean. Um, it's a hot topic, right, due to ongoing health challenge, the need for improved therapy with fewer, fewer side effects and easier administration, advancing technology, global health priority, and intersection with our other health issue. So this innovation of a hope for better outcome and uh, ultimately offer multiple options to people living with HIV for a better life. So in light of this progress, um, I typically want to establish a dialogue between uh, innovation and, and community li living with HIV. So for those who know ITPC, and I think there, there are a lot of people on the call who know us for, for many years, our mission has always been to enhance awareness, education, access, demand, and affordability of innovative HIV treatments. So we're here today with community experts who are here to share their knowledge with us. We want also to hear perspective from, um, from um, community with uh, Bots Bonella from Botswana with us, but also all of you, and you will see at the end that we we, we try to keep some uh, enough time right for all of us to discuss. So I'm going to stop here. Welcome, everyone, again. And uh, and Solange will give, uh, will give us some friendly remarks on the global landscape today on treatment innovation. So uh, the floor is yours, Solange. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's really good to see the, the number of people in our chat, although I can't see your face, sorry, in the participant list. 
although I can't see your faces, um, I know many of you and some of you I don't know, so I'm happy to make many friends. Um, I know that um, also from the list that many people here are working in the same space. So really want to draw upon a community conversation, a community dialogue. Um, we're going to share what we know and let you into any sort of uh, ongoing conversations at the global stage and share whatever we can with you and then open up for a really rich discussion um, uh, rather than some sort of teaching moment. Um, so thank you again for joining. Um, for those of us who have been in this game for a while, um, can probably be having a little bit of deja vu. So we think about the first ARVs that came on the scene. We can think about... Um, uh, recent change to dollar tegravir based regimens and now we, we're having this conversation about long acting agents so sometimes you'll see laa um, and sometimes you'll see lai and you the i is for the injectable part but the whole idea of having sort of a a, a trend towards new technologies that are allowing you to get medicine into your body for a longer period of time so that the frequency of your having to take the pill or the injection or whatever the, the way of administering the medicine um, is, is a longer period. Um, and this is not just for HIV, it's also for other, a range of other conditions. Um, so here we are trying to really open up and unpack the status of um, long acting uh, technologies uh, for treatment. So the focus of this webinar, just in case you are wondering, are we not going to talk about prevention? Will these two things are related but different? And this conversation is specifically focused on treatment. Um, I, uh, ITPC is also a member of the long acting steering committee that is looking at the state of access in low and middle income countries um, for long acting injectables and looking at the clinical trials and the results and what are the, some of the barriers to access and what are some of the um, steps that we need to take as civil society in a coordinated way. So there are many things that probably will be uncovered as we go through the agenda, which I think is, is really geared to um, what uh, we found out that um, this group would be interested in understanding. So some of it is on the science, as Nadia said, and then opening up for this Q&A, um, and, and Tracy's going to walk through, like, what is it and really how it works, um, and then the community perspectives and a conversation with you. And I think in that conversation, a lot of what we will have to address is, is it here? Can we take it? And, and is it ready for our country or our particular um, population that we are working with or a member of? And so there'll be some interesting discussions there, as you can imagine, um, and you probably already know that there are some access barriers and issues around affordability and even the quality of what, what is around. So we'll need to talk through some of those. And then we'll try to round out the conversation about what exactly can we do? How can we coordinate ourselves in the treatment space? I want to acknowledge that Mitchell uh, Warren is also on the call and he has been working tirelessly in the prevention space. And we both sit in certain spaces together. So it's not to separate prevention and treatment, but really just give treatment a bit of um, attention in this conversation so we can ask some of those treatment specific questions and then move into um, a discussion. So looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Just we'll stop there. Thanks, Nadia. Thank you, Solange. Um, so uh, Batwin is here to go through the basic of HIV infection and treatment as it's key to understand, right, how treatment works before going to treat to, uh, uh, different treatment options. So something many of you may know, but it's still good to refresh our knowledge. So thank you very much, Batwin. You have uh, 30 minutes. Thank you, Nadia. Um, I probably might not use all that. 30 minute uh, period just so that we can have more time for uh, a Tracy and question and answer and discussions. So my role really here would be to kind of go through some of the things that are the fundamental building blocks of intervening HIV infection 
uh, processes. What 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 is what is the science behind um, the various therapies we have to date? Because it's extremely important that in that understanding we are able to get into the academic spaces, the research spaces, the farmers faces the implementation at you know country level uh, the, the, the decision and policy making spaces based on clear understanding of what really is antiretroviral uh, therapy um having said that next slide uh, progression uh, no no the, the, yeah that one uh, i i always get inspired by my comrade uh, which I think should be the starting part of this webinar that, you know, long acting therapy will not matter and it won't work if people do not know about it and have confidence in it or have actual access to it. So I, I find this um, particularly stimulating the aspect of knowledge uh, to be able to be confident enough to go and advocate for um, various things that are not right, things that can be improved, or to advocate for good stuff that's there but is unre unreachable. So let's talk then about um, HIV itself. Um, next slide. We do know what HIV is, and I'm sure this will be a summary of what really HIV is all about. It's a virus, we all know that. It belongs to a certain family called the retroviruses. So that particular word is extremely important in understanding then why we call medicines that get to interrupt the replication of HIV, why we call them anti-retrovirals. Um, there are particular proteins and enzymes that we need to remember. All these slides will be available. There's a video coming up shortly, uh, but that it's important for us to remember four components of the virus. It's genetic material, which is the HIV uh, RNA. Then the three enzymes that the virus uses to rep reproduce and replicate, which are extremely important for us to then understand the different classes of antiretrovirals and these uh, 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 enzymes are the reverse transcriptase enzyme, the integrase enzyme and the protease uh, enzyme. Those are words I am uh, throwing in there for us to connect between um, what the antiretrovirals are in terms of their classes and what they actually uh, do. And in there, we will then be able to understand one of the antiretrovirals in under one class that Tracy after me, my colleague Tracy after me, will be able to describe in detail uh, other aspects of this particular um, antiretroviral. Um, next slide is to show that like every living thing, um, the HIV virus, um, needs to reproduce to survive. Um, the only thing with this particular organism is that it cannot do that on its own. It needs a host to replicate. Why? Because it essentially has RNA, which is the genetic material already described, unlike we humans who have DNA. I could go into details of this, but this is not the space to go, get into the details of, of this, but that the important point to make here is that this particular organism called the HIV virus needs a host. That host is human beings. And why human beings? Because there's a particular cell within the immune system of human beings that it targets for it to replicate. And that particular cell that's part of the immune system is the CD4 cell. So it targets the CD4 cell to be able to start the replication process. 
And the starting point of that uh, cycle is essentially it getting attached to the CD4 cell. And that attachment then is followed by fusion and subsequent entry of viral material into the CD4 cell. So if you remember the previous slide where I showed, I showed you the various components of the HIV virus, that's what's injected into the CD4 cell. And it is at that point that we say functionally and essentially that the CD4 cell has been infected. If that doesn't happen, then infection essentially doesn't happen. So the first step is entry. The second is, remember the HIV virus RNA genetic material without, without converting that into DNA, the replication cannot take place. So the first enzyme that goes into action is the reverse transcriptase enzyme that converts the HIV virus RNA into HIV virus DNA. So that with that happening, that HIV DNA gets inserted into the CD4 DNA. Because as I said, DNA is, or rather the genetic material is responsible for the manufacturing of any proteins for any living um, uh, uh, thing. So the HIV virus is smart enough to use viral DNA and insert it into the CD4 DNA to then make the CD4 cell produce viral material, which then gets to be sorted out by the protease enzyme. So the integration is a key component of, of um, viral replication. And the enzyme that is responsible for it is the integrase enzyme. That's important to remember for purposes of this particular mm -hmm. webinar. Once the genetic material gets to produce new viral proteins, then maturation happens and then a new uh, virus is produced. That's the short of the very long uh, process of viral uh, replication. So let me let me let me ask um, uh, Pagashne to play this video to summarize what I have said, just so that we can be able to conceptualize what I've I've, I've said. This inflammatory hyperpigmentation, i.e. my dark spots, are my biggest yeah, concern. Oh, my no, cinema and vitamin C. No, 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 no that's not it. The look of dark spots. Let me know what your skin concerns are and read my caption for more. No, 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 that's not it. Is it? Is it not this? No, no. Millions of people uh, live with HIV. Yes, that, that one, that one, that one. Defense against we can't see the... The body's defense. We can't see the thing. The system. I think progression e close your sh stop sharing yeah la launch the video and share again yeah. okay. sorry about that I always this always gets <laughs> uh, messy uh, via this Chill. webinar or oh, virtual I guess I might end up spending my 30 minutes after all. <laughs> yeah, that one. Millions of people live with HIV, a disease that weakens the body's defense against ordinary infections. The body's defense is the immune system made up of white blood cells, antibodies, and other cells. CD4, a type of white blood cell, bites off invaders. But HIV attacks CD4 cells. The HIV life cycle begins when HIV attaches itself to the CD4 cell and transfers its proteins and genetic materials into it. Next, an HIV enzyme called reverse transcriptase converts HIV RNA into HIV DNA, while an integrase enzyme integrates HIV DNA into the host CD4 cell's DNA. 
Then, the protease enzyme processes the produced HIV material for assembly into an immature virus. Finally, mature HIV materials are released into the body, where the cycle starts over again. Okay, so you can pause there, Ragashne. So we will send this um, for you to just keep replaying and replaying and replaying. And then, so the next stage is how do antiretrovirals actually interrupt this process? And the, and it may look simple in this, but it's a little more complicated, but it's actually also really not. So uh, Pragashne, press play. There is no cure for HIV, but antiretroviral medication, or ARVs, reduce HIV reproduction by interrupting the HIV life cycle. Entry inhibitors prevent HIV material from entering CD4 cells, while reverse transcriptase inhibitors stop the reverse transcriptase enzymes from converting HIV RNA into HIV DNA. Later, integrase inhibitors block HIV integrase enzyme from integrating HIV DNA into CD4 DNA. While protease inhibitors block the protease enzymes from enabling the production of new HIV material. By learning more about HIV and ARVs, you are better able to adhere to HIV treatment and protect others from getting infected. Thank you. Um, you can, um, yeah. So there is in that slide, another link when you get the, sl the slides that gives you an even more detailed uh, description just for your own uh, knowledge, the one that is below there. Um, but so essentially that's really how antiretrovirals uh, work. Next slide. And so because we now know that, then we essentially can classify antiretrovirals into four, right? So there are the reverse transcriptase inhibitors of two classes. First and foremost, the entry inhibitors, my bad, followed by the reverse transcriptase inhibitors that are of two subclasses, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Then the third class, which is really the basis of uh, most, most, mostly of this uh, webinar is the integrase inhibitors. And then the last class is the protease uh, inhibitors. We also know that uh, we have another class of the cuspid uh, inhibitors um, for which there is great research going on on, uh, on a long acting injectable uh, but I haven't, we haven't mentioned that uh, here, but that particular group of antiretrovirals interferes with the maturation part of things um, and interferes with the provirus uh, processes of things. We can read about that uh, in more detail. So what are in those classes of antiretrovirals? Next slide. Um, These are the classes that I've just described to you and how it works, and therein are examples. And we are familiar with um, examples of entry inhibitors, Maraviroc being one of them. We have we are very familiar with uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptases, and most of the antiretrovirals used today uh, fall under that class. We know about TDF, lamuvidin, and tricitabine. Then we have the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptases, and we uh, have uh, we know efavirenz and nevirapine, but also we do know about uh, repivirin that um, uh, Tracy is going to uh, mention about. Uh, and then we have the in integrase in inhibitors, and I'm sure probably the whole planet knows now about dolutegravir, and soon they will know about cabotegravir, which um, Tracy will. Uh, talk about. And then the protease inhibitors, we know about lopinavir, retunavir, garunavir, etc. Um, so we do know uh, back a bit. Um, so we know, if you look at uh, 
no, no, back, back. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the the process within which the virus goes through to be able to replicate those four stages in general, it is wise to always figure out how do we put a watertight um, intervention uh, to make sure that that virus actually doesn't get to replicate. So scientists and eventually WHO um, have recommendations that we all know uh, that involve um, a combination of antiretrovirals, right? So we can't just use one anymore. These days we use at least three. Um, maybe, hopefully, we'll go back to using two or one, depending on technologies that will be uh, available. So WHO uh, has made recommendations, first line, second line, third line that we know. So next slide, we do know uh, we do know that you know we use a combination of um, uh, uh, two um, uh, NNRTIs and NNRTIs, and now get to use uh, dolitegravir, which is an integrase uh, uh, inhibitor. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and that's the second line things of. Uh, uh, recommended regimens in general. Uh, next slide. So, yeah, next. Yeah, and then the third line usually is, uh, go back a bit. So third line is usually based on, you know, because by the time you get to third line, um, you failed quite a number of um, regimens and uh, resistance testing then Come, comes in here and the regimen that is prepared for you gets to be based on the genotypic testings that what what are you sensitive to and what are you resistant to and they pick the ones that are your sens they're, they're sensitive to to treatment and 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 use those and those combinations can go up to four or even five um it's unfortunate that we are very quickly heading here. Um, and that's why we are seeing an increase in advanced HIV disease because resistance is on the rise. People have gotten uh, uh, pill fatigue and are therefore not adherent much. And so the more, the sooner we get better technologies that are friendlier, that are convenient, the better. Uh, for us in ensuring better outcomes of therapy, uh, reduced mortality and definitely reduced uh, morbidity. Uh, next slide. So I want to end and introduce um, uh, Tracy to the next part by just looking at the innovations that have happened and are happening and will happen that really looks at three broad uh, areas. You look at how efficacious are those molecules, and the efficacy is all about how well do you interrupt the life cycle uh, of the HI virus replication. The second aspect is mode of delivery. All right. So, what are the methods of delivery? So, so far, the antiretrovirals we have are oral, though fixed dose which was a great innovation, but that we may need to look at better ways of either having orals or injectables or implants or patches or even suppositories. The other part of delivery is where you, you, you may need to focus on um, these uh, molecules or technologies. So through the skin, vaginal rings, we know exist now or nanotechnology, uh, which is also being considered. And then lastly, with the regard to delivery, in terms of convenience, how, how often do you want to, pro, uh, to, to have people take these meds? And how long would they stay in the body? And that's why we have now this bimonthly and 
hopefully very soon, every six months, etc. At the end of the day, though, we need, uh, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, though, we need um, to achieve cure, right? To eradicate the virus. And technologies around that uh, may need to be increased and improved upon. Uh, we do know about technologies using neutralizing antibodies, stem technology, which is cannot be put to scale, but uh, we accidentally discovered it, vaccines to achieve not only prevention, but actually cure. Uh, those are those are the things that uh, as communities and civil society need to be aware of and get the appetite to get to know every so often what's going on, how can we contribute to um, the advancement of uh, these uh, technologies. So thank you very much for the time and I will uh, give it back to Nadia. Thank you very much, Patrine. So um, uh, we will share PowerPoint at the end and also link to other resources if you wanna know more. Uh, we have a lot a breath, a breath of material that we develop at ITPC uh, on the HIV cycle and other issue. And uh, thank you again, Patrine. And um, Tracy, the floor is yours. So we're going to discuss now specifically long acting injectable for treating HIV infection. We're not going to go on, um, on treatment. Uh, also, there are a lot of progress um, and a lot of existing resource on injectable for treatment, for prevention, sorry. Uh, but let's focus today on treatment. Thank you, back to, um, thank you Tracy. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Bactrin, for opening things up. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Let me share my screen with you. I have much lower tech homemade animations. Uh, let's see. Where is my... Oh, there. Okay, can everybody see this in full screen mode? Perfect. Great. So I'm Tracy Swan. I've been working with ITPC as a consultant for many, many years. And I've been an AIDS treatment activist for forever. So we're going to start with some background because to really think about long acting treatment, one of the most important things to think about is drug resistance. So after the background, I'm gonna cover what long-acting HIV treatment is right now, how it's given, how well it works, what are the side effects from it, who is eligible for this current treatment, who is it not recommended for, and long-acting treatments in the pipeline that are coming. So first, a lot of people talk about resistance and I often feel like if you ask 10 different people to explain it, including doctors, researchers, people living with HIV, et cetera, you might get 10 different explanations. So I wanted to walk through it with all of you pretty clearly. So if someone is not taking antiretroviral treatment, HIV is going to make millions and millions of copies of itself each and every day. And not all of these copies are identical. Some of them have little teeny changes in their genetic structure. And these changes are called mutations. And mutations happen at random. The virus does not have a plan. It's sort of like making hundreds of Xerox copies of something. Copy number 700 isn't gonna look exactly like your original copy. And some mutations are totally harmless but other mutations and combinations of mutations can make a single ARV or a whole family of ARVs less effective or cause them to stop working. That's called drug resistance. And people living with HIV who have drug resistance are at risk of treatment failure, severe illness and death. So the point is we wanna make it harder for resistance to happen. 
And there are two different kinds of drug resistance. One is called pretreatment HIV drug resistance. Some people who are living with HIV have drug resistance, even though they've never been on treatment. So this can happen if someone happens to get infected with a virus that is already drug resistant, or if they used ARVs for a really short time, such as late pregnancy. So WHO has done a bunch of surveys of this, and they found that about 10% of people who have just been diagnosed with HIV have pretreatment resistance. And the mostly they have resistance to the class of drugs that are called non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors or NNRTIs. And the drugs I'm really talking about are efavirenz and nevirapine because those drugs have been used a lot in low and middle income countries, especially before the switch to recommending dalutegravir for first line treatment. So resistance to NNRTI, those rates are up to three times higher among people who have been exposed to ARVs in the past, and especially infants. In some countries, up to half of the infants who are newly diagnosed with HIV will have resistance to NNRTIs. So when you hear this, it really makes sense that the world switched to a completely different family of drugs integrase inhibitors, that's what dalutegravir is. And then there, the other type is called acquired drug resistance. So when a person misses their doses, the ARVs in their bloodstream get become too low. It can also happen for other reasons. But at this point, the drugs can't really do their job. They can't stop HIV from reproducing. And this gives HIV a chance to reproduce, and some of the copies it makes may have resistance mutations. So there are a lot of reasons why this happens. I think um, sometimes people get lazy or they're not thoughtful, and they often sort of put the blame on the person taking the ARVs themselves, but this is really wrong. A lot of times they're drug stockouts or people's bodies can't absorb the drugs properly because they might have another illness. Um, sometimes they, they're taking other medicines that interact with their ARVs. That can make the ARV levels lower. And sometimes people are too sick to feel like taking their drugs. And there are tons of life circumstances too that make taking pills every day, which is called adherence, really challenging pregnancy, childcare, depression, so many things. So it's really important to think about what's causing it and think about the best ways to address it. So why does adherence matter? In other words, I love using a picture. If you look at the line that's going across this graphic that says minimum level, and then you see the line that's the drug levels, dosing is designed to keep drugs in a person's body up to a certain level. Then if people miss doses, the drugs can drop to a lower level. This is sometimes called a subtherapeutic level. And also here are my very low tech graphics to explain this in a really different way without all these words. But those big circles are the CD4 cells and little red things you see are lots of little HIV viruses circulating around, getting in CD4 cells and then making more of themselves in these cells as Bactrin explained, and then going out in the bloodstream to infect more CD4 cells. But what you see is some of them are a little different. They have mutations. So, how does this relate to drug resistance? So this drug resistance really means a bacteria or a virus can still grow in the presence of a drug or several drugs that would normally stop it from growing or kill it. But in the clearest possible way that I could think of showing this, there is someone is taking their ARVs. They stop some of the virus, but they can't always stop the virus that's resistant. So what happens is these viruses just keep get, making more of themselves 
without the ARVs to stop it. So keeping that in the back of your mind, I'm now gonna switch gears and talk about long acting HIV treatment, what it is, how often it's given and where, how well it works, why it's sometimes- <clears throat> Combien de fois on le prescrit Comment ça marche Est-ce que ça marche bien Pourquoi ça échoue for it, Who it's not recommended for and what is coming in the future. Okay, so taking pills every day is not easy and there are so many reasons why it's hard for people. People can be worried about privacy and stigma. Some people hate taking pills, are fed up with it, or just can't remember them. So this was the idea behind developing long-acting versions of HIV medicines. So long-acting antiretrovirals are designed to be released very slowly and steadily in someone's body over weeks to months to replace having to take oral ARVs. And there is one approved totally long-acting treatment regimen it's a combination of two ARVs, cabotegravir or CAB, which is a member of the integrase inhibitor family, and rapivirine, um, which is a member of the NNRTI family. Now, just as a note, cabotegravir by itself is also used for HIV prevention, but I'm really focusing on how it's used together with rapivirine for HIV treatment. And this regimen was approved in high-income countries during 2020 and 2021. So it's been around for a couple years. So how is it given? It's given as two injections, one for each ARV, which is in the buttocks. And these injections need to be given by a trained healthcare worker obviously in a private setting because people aren't really going to want to have something like this in an area where a lot of other people can see what's going on. Researchers are looking into giving the injections in people's thigh instead of in the buttocks, and that might make it possible for people to self-inject these ARVs, but they're not ready for that yet, and the research is ongoing. So this does mean people have to go to a healthcare center to get their long acting injections. And how often is it given? Well, this combination of long acting cabotegravir and rapivirine was studied in and approved for a certain group of people. The people it was studied in were already on ARVs, their viral load was already suppressed. So that is who it's approved for. This is called the indication. And this is because regulators can't start saying that other people should use drugs that they haven't been studied in. Like there's a big difference between someone who's just starting their ARVs and someone who's been treatment experienced and maybe is on second or third line treatment. So you can't say, oh, because this worked for, you know, First line, it's gonna work for everyone, just to make that clear. So this person who is virally suppressed can switch right away from their oral treatment to injections of long-acting cabotegravir and rapivirine, or they can take an oral version of cab cabotegravir and rapivirine for 30 days before starting their long-acting cabotegravir rapivirine injections. And taking the oral meds is called a lead-in. This was studied in most of the clinical trials because they thought people might have problems with side effects, um, that people might be allergic to the drug, and they were really cautious about putting something in someone's body that would last for a month or two without a way to take it out. But as more and more people got this treatment, it became clear that the oral lead-in wasn't really necessary. But again, this is something about how the drug was studied. Some regulators say it is necessary because they're looking at certain trials and other regulators say, no, you could just go ahead and start. So what the US FDA label says is there's an optional oral lead-in one month before you start 
with two daily pills. And then you go right into the long acting injections. At day, day one, you get two injections. And then a month later, you get another two injections. And after that, you get these two injections every two months. So you can either start with the oral lead in, whoops, sorry about that. Let me see if, or just go right to having the injections. Those are two ways to give it. And how well does this treatment work? Well, in two large clinical trials, this oral long acting cabotegravir and recovering worked as well as daily oral treatment. And so the original trial was 48 weeks long, but people were followed for another two years. So over about three years, um, HIV treatment failed for about one to 2% of the people who got oral ARVs. And for 2% of people who received long acting injections of cabotegravir and rapivirine. I wanna point out that clinical trials are different from real life. People may be more motivated. They have a lot more supervision, a lot more follow-up care. They get a lot more attention and support for what they're doing. So adherence in real life is rarely this good, but this does give us a really good idea about, okay, this stuff works. The problem is that it doesn't always work for every single person. The failure, drug failure rate in these trials was really small. Um, it was 23 people out of 1,651 people who had long acting treatment failure. But the problem for these people is they developed resistance to both drugs. That means that each of these drugs and all the others in the same family will no longer work for them. Okay, so that's kind of the spoiler. And why does that happen? Well, these drugs are really long acting. They can linger in the bloodstream for months to over a year after a person gets their last injection at levels that are way too low to be effective. And if someone misses their injection and they don't start taking oral ARVs right away, they could develop resistance to both drug families. And there are some other risk factors because some people in these trials didn't miss their doses. So researchers had to really look and see what might be linked with a higher risk for treatment failure. And having a body mass index above 30, so people who weigh a lot are at higher risk. Um, people who already have resistance to repivirine, which is fairly common among people who have had NNRTI treatment failure because it's in that family. And then there's also having certain subtypes of HIV called A1 and A6. Um, A6 is usually found in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. A1 is usually found in Western Europe and the UK. But you know, HIV can travel around in ways that people don't even travel. So you could never say, okay, you're from the UK, you must have this, or you're from you know, so if Ukraine, you must have that. What, what would happen in a perfect world is there would be subtype testing, but that is only available anywhere in a research setting. No one's gonna get a subtype test. It's just something that was picked up in research. Okay, so what are the side effects? And I wanna say we just talked about treatment failure, but this does work very well for a large amount of people. So the biggest side effect was injection site reactions. Um, people said the injections hurt a lot. There was pain and swelling afterwards. Um, they found small lumps under the skin or thicker hardened skin um, that usually lasted for three days and tended to happen less often over time. I read some acceptability surveys that said that people said 
the longer, the more used to the shots they got, the less they hurt. So that is good news. Um, and the other side effects, which were reported by at least 2% of people in clinical trials were fever, feeling tired, and headache, muscle pain, having trouble sleeping, being dizzy, having abnormal dreams, and rash. Most of these were mild to moderate. There are other side effects that may be worse, but they're much rarer. And for the sake of time and for you know us being able to have a really good discussion about all of this, I'm not gonna go into them during this presentation. Okay, so now we get to the tricky part, who is eligible for this. This long acting treatment is not recommended by the World Health Organization really because it was only studied in a very specific group of people. It's adults and adolescents who are age 12 or over that weigh at least 35 kilograms. People have to have a suppressed viral load, no history of um, ARV treatment failure, and no evidence of drug resistance. So what this means is you can't use it as first line treatment because people have a detectable viral load before they start treatment. You can't use it as second line treatment because people usually switch to second line treatment because their first line treatment has stopped working. So it kind of doesn't have a really practical place in the world of treatment. It's getting out there as a convenience regimen more for people who want to switch. And I think the good thing about that is when better long acting treatments come along, there'll be some good practical implementation data, but this one is not quite ready for everybody. And who is it not recommended for? So for people on ARVs who have a detectable viral load, for people who have a history of HIV treatment failure, for people with evidence of resistance, resistance to drugs from the same families as cabotegravir and rapivirine. Now this is what's tricky. A lot of low and middle income countries cannot always provide drug resistance testing because it's expensive. And also it requires complicated laboratory facilities and the results can take a long time. So it's not super practical. And it's only used sometimes for people who have been on a lot of different treatments, um, as Bactrin was explaining, um, for third line where they really need to find drugs that will work for somebody. But often the way WHO makes their treatment guidelines, they select drugs that are likely to work for people for whatever treatment situation they're in. First line drugs are likely to work for almost everybody. Second line drugs are really likely to work for people that first line drugs don't work in and so on. But as people are on more and more treatments, it gets harder to find a combination of drugs that will work for them. Okay, also there's not enough information on these drugs during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So they're not recommended in those circumstances, although Research is collecting this information, so we should know more. Um, you can't use these drugs during TB treatment that includes rifampicin, rifabutin, or rifapentine. And rapivirin requires a cold chain, which means it has to be kept cold from the minute it, it leaves the factory to when it goes into someone's gluteal muscle. So people who are in areas where it's not possible to keep medicines at a cold, stable temperature during delivery and storage won't be able to get it. And also some people living with HIV also have hepatitis B. They, need med they may need medication to treat their hepatitis B. So it doesn't mean they can't use this, but it does mean they would need to still be on daily oral medicine for their hepatitis B. 
So as I've been saying, we're really still learning about the, these long acting drugs. And there are some real life studies that are looking at this long acting combination in people who are not included in clinical trials, um, including there's a very small study in San Francisco um, that's among people who are homeless. Um, some of them are struggling with drug use and mental health um, problems, et cetera. And they're looking at giving to this to people in a very supervised situation once a month instead of every two months. Um, some real life studies are looking at it in people who actually did have some treatment experience. So we will know more about using this in other groups, but it's not really the best regimen for everyone as you can probably tell from what I've been saying. And I'd like all of you to remember this great expression someone said to me years ago, first to market is usually not best to market. It's true with cell phones, it's true with computers, and it's, it's true with cars and it's true with antiretrovirals. What comes out first usually gets better over time. And there are other long acting antiretrovirals in the pipeline. There's one called lenacapavir or LEN, which is from a brand new ARV family called capsid inhibitors. Right now it's approved as part of treatment for people who need new types of ARVs to suppress the virus because they have very limited treatment options. But it is also being studied for HIV prevention and for HIV treatment in first line and in people with some treatment experience. So those results should be out either later this year or early, early next year. And LEN is interesting because it's given after a short oral lead-in as two injections every six months. But one thing, this drug is gonna need partners because I don't know how exciting it is to say, I get this one drug you know, every six months, but I still have to take the other ones every day. That's not really enough of a breakthrough, I think, but it could be great for prevention. And um, companies are looking at, say, how to make long acting cabotegravir even longer acting. That might be a combination. So this is an option. There's also oral versions of len lenacapavir plus another one called islatravir from a brand new family. Those pills are taken once a week. There's a trial looking at that. It's in development, so we'll learn more about that. There are other long-acting drugs from the integrase inhibitor family and a long-acting version of dalutegravir, tenofovir, and lamivudine, or TLD. And researchers are also looking at new ways to deliver long-acting ARVs, such as implants. And I wanna leave you with a concept that I've used to think about drugs which is called FUBU. But before we get to FUBU, I think it's really important to plan for the future because better long acting ARVs are being developed, although it may take some time for them to arrive and we all need to prepare for them. But one thing to think about is FUBU. You may be wondering why I'm showing you this picture, but FUBU is an amazing clothing company that is black owned. It was started in a garage in Queens, New York in 1992. The same four people still own the company. It was valued at 8 billion in 2021. You're looking at some vintage FUBU clothing. But the thing about FUBU is it stands for for us, by us. And I feel like we need to think of treatment. Maybe we're not drug developers or pharma companies, but what are, what's our FUBU? What do we need? Do we need something that will work for lots and lots of people um, that people can inject themselves? Like where's the FUBU in here? And with that, that is my last slide. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, uh, um, I'm sure and I hope uh, everyone learned a lot and uh, uh, the work is in progress. Um, uh, 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 we still have, it still can get better over time. 
and we need to continue uh, to watch out what is happening. I think people may have a lot of questions. Remember that we still have one panelist, um, Cindy from Bonella, who want to give some community perspective. So please um, hold your question. You can already write them in the chat, but uh, it's a very good, very good start for a very helpful conversation among ourselves. So um, as ITPC, we... Uh, Right, we consult community in few countries to openly, uh, for them to openly share their thought, concern, and expectation related to the introduction of LAS for HIV uh, treatment in their respective community. And we ask specific questions, right? We were, we ask what are their initial thought or concern about the introduction of LA? Um, do they foresee any challenge in accessing or using this new even innovation? What are the opportunities uh, in their respective country? What expectation a community have from a healthcare provider and other stakeholder? And what are their opinion on how community organization and civil society best support the successful rollout or um, of this project in the future? So Cindy is here from Bonella. Uh, based in Botswana to share community perspective um, on those uh, very key questions. So, Cindy, the floor is yours. Uh, Cindy may not be able to, to be on camera because she has no connection. Maybe you can just say hi, and after progression, we will uh, show your presentation. Thank you, Cindy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello, Cindy. Thank you so much, um, Nadia, and thank you to Tracy's presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I wish I had, you know, had access to that information before I made my presentation. <laughs> but nonetheless, I guess um, I'll, I'll go ahead. So um, from a community perspective, we understand that um, despite what Tracy said, um, long acting injectables um, for treatment are available and trials have been done and um, there is evidence of efficacy and also there is evidence of um, the treatment improving or the medication improving treatment outcomes. So that is the perspective um, on which I'm making my presentation. And I want to use Botswana as an example. Um, in Botswana, we have this euphoria around um, the, reaching the 95, 95, 95, 95% of people, 95, 95, 95 targets, 95% uh, of people who know their HIV status, 95% of those who are on treatment, and 95% of those who are virally suppressed. So we think that there is a great opportunity for us as communities to ride on this um, um, bandwagon and ensure that we frame our advocacy for access to long acting antiretroviral therapy within the context of the 95-95-95. We think that um, the long acting antiretroviral therapy can possibly be a game changer in supporting countries, including our own, to achieve um, 100, 100, 100, 100. Because currently our target as a country is 522, 522, sorry. So at a local level, there is um, evidence that supports this. Um, when we look at the BIAS-5 that was recently released, which um, basically situated Botswana as a country that has reached the 95-95-95, also showed that there are gaps 
in viral load suppression. So we know that if there are gaps in viral load suppression, it basically means that there are opportunities for infection. And when that happens, it means we won't be able to get to 100, 100, 100, or 522, which is the target for the country. And when we look closely at who is not virally suppressed, it's the, it's the females from ages 15 to 49 years um, who, are, who have not reached the 95 um, of, of viral suppression. So it basically means that in our view, if we are looking at cohorts that should be prioritized um, for access to long acting injectables, this is one of the cohorts that needs to be prioritized. And then, um, And then when we, we move ahead, we also note that um, there is a gap in terms of viral suppression among men. So when you compare females and males in terms of um, viral suppression, we have uh, more, we have females who are more virally suppressed than, than males. So in terms of prioritizing who then would help us contribute to us reaching the target of 95, 95, 95, if not surpassing it and reaching 100, 100, 100, 100, then we have to prioritize men. So in our maybe uneducated view, um, as communities, we strongly think that we have to rely on country context for us to determine who is eligible for um, long acting um, antiretroviral um, treatment. Um, in, the, in the report, it was also clear that viral load suppression among women aged 15 to 49 years by pregnancy status is also, um, should also be considered. But what is interesting is that um, pregnant women and women who recently delivered or those who are breastfeeding, they are in a better position than other groups when it comes to viral suppression. Yet in our guidelines for long-acting in, long injectables, breastfeeding women and pregnant women have been prioritized as the first group to enter the first trials. So as communities, we are really agitating for us to continuously use data to inform how we move forward with respect to long acting injectables. I keep interchanging in long acting injectables and long acting antiretroviral therapy and treatment I'm not sure if I'm creating confusion, um, but I'll continue anyway. So there's also data coming from the commun community-led monitoring um, work, which also indicates that there is dissatisfaction about ARV um, refill duration. There are also complaints about peel burdens, and there are also issues and struggles with, is with, with um, issues relating to lab supplies because they are in inconsistencies. There are also challenges with treatment monitoring 
um, in some instances, even results are missing, which should inform your next um, refill. Um, and services are not rendered um, um, client centric, and there are also limited hours of service, and there are challenges with service integration, as well as psychosocial support at um, facility le level. So one of the recommendations, um, which I think supports um, availability and accessibility to long acting injectables is around availing other formulations. So I want to believe that long acting injectables or long acting antiretrovirals are one of those formulations that from a community perspective, should they be implemented um, with fidelity, then they may help in terms of addressing some of the challenges that have been highlighted through um, community-led monitoring. And then um, there's also results from the stigma index, which clearly indicate that we are still having challenges with stigma, primarily um, internalized stigma. My view is that whether it's external stigma or internal stigma, the effects are the same. So it basically means that we still have stigma and discrimination to address within our communities. So can long-acting injectables have a, a positive um, contribution to reducing the stigma levels? And you will see from our community or from the results of our community engagement um, that yes, there is a strong belief and push that if we do use um, injectables, they have the, the opportunity to contribute to stigma reduction and address some of the human rights issues that we are currently facing. But most importantly, they also stand a chance to contribute to health system strengthening. So we, through the support of um, ITPC, were able to hold community engagements so that we understand where communities are at with regards to access to um, long-acting injectables. It was evident from the onset that there are fears and fears that are coming from the community are rela related to accessibility, um, to timely delivery, to availability, um, you know, issues around shortage of um, storage space, uh, limited regimen options, um, lack of public education and awareness on, in, on the innovation and safety. Um, there are also fears around pain intolerance to needles, um, side defects that could be experienced, um, and how other marginalized groups such as people with disabilities can be effectively integrated into the program. There are also fears of stockouts. Um, there are fears around affordability, um, lack of trained um, healthcare workforce, and shortage of um, healthcare workforce, which are already issues that are prevalent in our healthcare facilities. There is also lack of education, particularly around U equals U, and there are also fears around issues related to migration. Um, there are also challenges around supply chain management and issues around role clarity. Who, who, is, who is expected to do what, to what extent? Um, there are also issues around lab capacity. 
And there are fears around misinformation, as we know that any new, um, any introduction or an introduction of a new um, approach may result in misinformation if we do not invest in um, community education. So we also got to understand um, government perspective, or at least where government is at insofar as rolling out um, long acting injectables. We understand that there are going to be trials that will be carried out over two years to mainly assess its sustainability. There are considerations for affordability before national rollout. Um, so we are also informed from a government perspective that long acting injectables are very expensive as compared to oral treatment suggesting that at government level, um, cost may be a serious um, consideration for how we move forward. And that then brings us to the role of civil society. We know that when ARV started, the same was being said, that they are too expensive. Some countries may not be able to afford um, some countries may not be able to have storage. Um, some countries do not have access to time. They wouldn't know when is the right time to take it. There was a lot of um, um, doubt about whether that can be accomplished. But here we are, 40 years later, um, we are all treatment experts in our own right. And we have succeeded um, to put a lot of people on treatment. So this didn't just come about. It came about because communities were advocating, were lobbying, um, were engaging governments so that um, the, the, the treatment can be made available. There was a lot of effort that also went into advocating for these um, medicines to be made cheaper. Because remember when we started, the prices were higher, but now we are talking about affordable prices. We were not given on a silver platter. We fought um, for, that, for those prices to go down. In the same way, while we start with long acting injectables being relatively expensive, it's again our responsibility as civil society to do what we have done before and lobby and advocate for the for 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 the injectables to be to be accessible and affordable so in terms of our context um pregnant mothers and mothers who are breastfeeding are the first groups that are earmarked to undergo clinical trials. I don't know now, within the context of what Tracy um, presented, uh, <laughs> what this means. Maybe it's something that I do not um, understand. So in this engagement, there was acknowledgement that um, involving civil society in particular is really key also learning from the lessons that we have um, in the AIDS response, that communities are to be at the center of, the, of any response. In the same way, if we are to roll out long acting injectables successfully, then communities have to be empowered. They have to be given the space. Um, in the absence of that space, I think communities are really good at creating spaces where they can be had and where they can advocate for better access. So in terms of opportunities, um, involvement of civil society in clinical trials is really critical. Um, and it should be encouraged, encouraged at all levels. Um, 
We also stand a very good chance of addressing or mitigating pill fatigue. As um, an earlier speaker said, um, you know, it's not easy to take treatment for such a long time. Um, so this will help in terms of reducing um, pill fatigue. Um, we also know that there will be better adherence, especially for adolescents and people with disability. And it will also be convenient for caregivers um, of adolescents and um, people with disabilities. Um, we can also assure um, confidentiality and privacy, given that um, it is injected on, um, on people's um, buttocks. And then um, there is also opportunity of reduced self-stigma and increased confidence, um, integration of SRH, SRHR and uh, HIV services, as well as capacity building for civil society and communities on the long acting uh, injectables. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, we think that it is important for us to have treatment education plans. I really liked um, Tracy's um, presentation, and I think every civil society member or every community member needs to have access to that information because we can only be able to advocate if we have the right information. We also need to put in place advocacy plans um, so that we can advocate for better access. Um, we also need health worker in healthcare worker engagement plans um, because if healthcare workers do not buy into these new innovations, then their chances of being rolled out will be very much um, limited or none at all. We have learned through HIV that when you educate the healthcare worker, then they are able to improve access. We are currently having challenges with um, PrEP. There are healthcare workers who believe that um, PrEP is actually a waste of medication because you are giving ARVs to somebody who is not HIV positive. Um, so it's important for healthcare workers to be engaged and also educated. Um, we also need um, plans for monitoring access and use. So with those few remarks, um, that is the civil society perspective that I wanted to share with you. Ah, I still have another slide, sorry. <laughs> and this is about expected impact. Um, we expect that um, long acting injectables will de de decongest our healthcare facilities, um, they'll be able to reduce waste waiting times and encourage attendance um, and contribution to a more efficient healthcare system. Um, it will also be a means to improve the quality of life, particularly of women facing challenges with um, adherence to oral treatment during exper experiences, especially related to gender-based violence or intimate partner violence um, or discordant couples. Um, we also believe that long acting injectables um, are, are considered a solution to address uh, treatment fatigue as I've already um, indicated. Um, this is also an opportunity for resource mobilization and the escalating advocacy um, for widespread rollout and HIV related education. What we basically learned is that treatment literacy has really been put on the back burner. Um, clients who are on treatment, who were part of these dialogues, they know nothing about the treatment they are taking, let alone the, the names of those um, treatments and how they work and interact with their bodies. So it's important that we bring back treatment literacy and ensure that our communities are empowered to engage with, um, with, 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 with government. They are also empowered 
to take responsibility for their own health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cindy. And uh, that was very interesting. And, you know, listening to you um, remind, um, remind us how the approach should be um, a very careful approach. And at the same time, how literacy is important to empower community. And uh, I just want to tell everyone that we develop a fact sheet uh, on, on um, injectable for treatment. Um, that uh, we translate into French that will be disseminate uh, the coming the next week. We're going to share also the PowerPoint and the and the recording of this dialogue today. But thank you, Cindy. Um, uh, really appreciated that um, you consult community and you you provide informed data to all of us. Uh, you're really on ahead of the game, right? And uh, and. Um, and I saw in the chat also that some other people are interested to uh, inform and conduct dialogue in the country, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is very good. So I think <clears throat> you already had questions from Tracy around pregnant women. I'm sure people have question um, overall. Uh, and I want to open the, the floor for question. Some questions were on the chat and were already answered, but but let's take uh, maybe 15 minutes uh, to first hear a question to the panelists and maybe after to have a quick discussion on your perspective from your different context. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. I see in the chat, you know, if I want to launch a little bit like the discussion, I know that some people are interested to have to have survey on injectable that we can use with our community. I guess you want to assess the knowledge and also uh, the perspective from your own community. So we have developed a survey that we can share with you. Um, there were also um, question about what will happen to country that cannot afford uh, injectable. Is it something that we can advocate for? Uh, so maybe uh, maybe it's a question for Tracy to start with. Um, sure, absolutely. Actually, ITPC has another pillar called Make Medicines Affordable, and that is the focus of their work, advocacy for making medicines affordable. And there are different pathways to access. It might be really great to go into more detail in a webinar on this with um, people who are more expert than I am at this. But there are several, several different avenues. But the other thing is the drugs need to be registered in your countries. That's one of the first steps. And when I was giving this presentation, I looked on the website of Vive, the company that makes cabotegravir, and there's no information at all about where the long acting treatments are registered. And I think, you know, just checking to see if that's even happening is a really good first step. And a really, um, I don't want to take up all the time, but there are different ways and make medicines affordable is doing an incredible job. And really there's a wealth of information that they have available. It's a great resource. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. I also saw co very interesting comment from uh, Mokete. Sorry if I uh, if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, which I think it's you know what we presented really helped understand the issue around safety and efficient efficacy, and and that which may delay the buying of the community. So everybody here is like confirming the careful approach, right? Uh, about when we are talking about long acting for treatment. And, but at the same time, right, staying on top of the game and pushing for improve, uh, improve uh, injectable for treatment in the coming years, hopefully. So, yeah. So I see more comments than questions, but. Yes. Sorry, Nadia, Lindiwe Mondi. Yes. You can go ahead. She raised her hand. Can you hear okay, her? great. Hello. Hi, Lindiwe. Uh, okay. 
Thank you so much, uh, Naida and Tracy and Cindy for the presentation. It was very informative. I think mine is not a question per se. It's an observation that as uh, countries, uh, we are experiencing one, one and the same uh, thing when it comes to issues of treatment. Also, um, what, uh, as I think for all, it's now it's not as it was before when it comes to issues of treatment literacy at community level. That has been ignored, not because uh, uh, recipients of care or organizations of recipients of care do not want to do that. It's issues of resources to do that at community level. I remember when we were switching to DTG as a country, that was done at national level, but when it rolling it, cascading it down to community level, there was no not enough resources uh, to do that. And that has caused uh, people at, at uh, communities not to have enough information when it comes to issues of treatment, not to have enough information when it comes to even advocating for treatment that they want in their local facilities. So I think it's one of the things that is happening even here in uh, uh, Swati. And also, again, as a country, we experience shortage in treatment. And my question is, if when we when we introduce the, the injectable drug, I, I'm just wondering in terms of how are we going to afford this as a country? And but thank you that uh, Tracy just mentioned that as ITPC, you have that pillar. Probably that will also assist us and also engaging the the ministry and you you know when we are when we are introducing this as a country yeah i think basically it's that it's the more aggressive uh, sensitization and mobilization of communities because people out there they really do not know much now on their treatment thank you over Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think we still have a long road ahead of us, right? Like which is first ensuring that the um, a community are informed and then together also collectively uh, work on affordability. Um, and uh, that's a that's a work we are, you know, uh, we we are taking on right at ITPC very seriously. And I know, like you also hold some dialogue in the Swatini, and I guess, uh, Lindy, where some of the conclusions are similar to the one of Cindy, right, on the community perspective. Do you have something more to add also based on your own country context, in addition to accessibility and affordability? No, I don't think I have any. I think it's the same situation even with the Swana. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment or question or perspective from the panelists? Okay. Okay, I think um, <clears throat> I think we can come to a close if there is no other comment from the room, and uh, really, we really appreciate right like uh, the insight and perspective and um, sharing of knowledge. And uh, Solange, maybe if we can have some uh, um, some closure remark. Sure, and thank you to you, Nadia, and to the rest of the team. Um, really good presentations. Um, and I know sometimes for participants, it's slightly um, a lot. It's a lot to sometimes ask your question in an open forum. So feel free to follow up with us um, as you like. Um, feel free to email any questions uh, from the complex advocacy pricing to science, uh, whatever it is, please feel free to ask. We're here to support and make sure that um, information is accurate and shared as widely as possible. Um, so yeah, I mean, thanks Doctrine for, um, you know, reinforcing the importance of, of the science of how the virus works in the body, but more importantly, how antiretrovirals work and um, the reinforcing and underscoring the importance of treatment literacy. And it kind of ties into the comments that Linda Wei just made as well as 
obviously Tracy's um, presentation, but Cindy in particular, um, and really finding in some of the engagements that we've had around um, long acting, um, where people are still unaware of the name of the medicine or the type of medicine that they're taking. Um, so really want to reinforce that point around the importance of treatment education and understanding some of the simple things around the medicine that one is taking. So we will do our best to support those efforts at a country level, at a community level, at a local level. Um, and then Tracy, the first to market, <laughs> not the best is something that will certainly stick with me. Um, and it's so true. So I think we are hopeful in this, in this meeting. I mean, um, it's being recorded so it can be shared with others who may um, miss out on the time of this call or not been able to ask that question. They could re you know, rewind and listen to a specific part again because it was quite dense in, in terms of its information. But I think it's, a, it's very promising where we're going, but we need all folks, every stakeholder to kind of put their part in. So communities have a role manufacturers have a role, governments have a role, private sector has a role, um, and we, we all need to, to put in our bit um, to, to get this to where um, it is something that can work for everyone that needs it. Um, and Cindy, yeah, just coming back on that pricing point, um, there are lots of concerns around pricing and access in terms of low and middle income countries and it being sort of the the, the, the option that is just a convenient option for sometimes in, in higher income countries um, is something that we are certainly trying to fight against. But as you all kind of alluded to, we've seen this play out before and we know what is required to get this to something that is for everyone everywhere. Um, so I think it's just there I want to end on a note that is hopeful and in terms of what communities can do, I've jotted down a few things, which I think also will overlap with the document that Nadia will share um, soon that we'll put out, but really making sure that communities are part of the solution, um, not passive recipients of whatever they do out there, then the countries will get, but really being involved from the design, the clinical trials, the implementation, the service delivery, the um, pricing, the access, the policy, the coordination at a global level, not at a national level, only regional and, and global as well. Communities have a role. And so if you're unclear of how you can have an entry point, what you can do, feel free to reach out to us and we could talk through some of those opportunities to collaborate as partners. Um, so we can advocate together for increased access. We can make sure we monitor the rollout and the delivery of the HIV long acting treatment in terms of assessing and reporting on the access and quality stuff. So community led monitoring was raised by Cindy and I think alluded to by uh, other um, presenters as well as an important way to something that's important that we can monitor from a community perspective and be able to, to talk to different aspects of long acting, whether it be access in terms of um, pricing. I wanted to just let, and talk through as we were, as I reflect on the different kinds of spaces I've been in and different kinds of conversations was around this whole idea of don't generate demand for something that's not ready. So don't go around doing a whole bunch of webinars again, people excited when this thing is not ready. <laughs> balanced with this whole conversation of, well, it is the pressure and the civil society and communities that are affected, people living with HIV that need to be able to apply the pressure to know what the science is saying and have access as much as other people in other places to be able to get their countries to get the access and to get it at an affordable price for their governments um, so that they can actually be using it like other people in other spaces. So it's an interesting debate. So if you ever find yourself caught in that, I mean, I think the place that we land is, as you can see, we're having a webinar. So the whole concept of don't get people excited about something till it's perfectly ready. Um, we want to share the knowledge, share the information and make sure you are aware and you can ask informed questions and reach out to ITPC at any point for any further support that you may need, whether it's on information, advocacy, or access pricing policy, the bigger stuff in the global space. 
Um, so thanks very much. And um, yes, yeah, same to you, Mitchell. Thank you. We we do work. Um, if we don't build demand now, there will never be a market. Exactly. I'm just reading what Mitchell is saying. So I just want to say thank you to Nadia and her team and to special thanks to Tracy and Bactrin and Cindy, who is also a board member of ITPC, and to our interpreters who are probably just caught myself how fast I may have been speaking, um, who have kept up with us in the webinar. So handing over to you again, Nadia, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, we're going to make this uh, webinar accessible. We're going to share the material and we hope to continue uh, to, uh, working together on this and please stay in touch. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.